Okay, guys, you know me, so I don't have to introduce myself, but actually I have to introduce and to announce, and it's my great pleasure, great pleasure to announce uh, Italo Vignoli is our first speaker here, and it turned out to be pretty tricky to announce Italo Vignoli because his background is really, really, really interesting. He has been active in high-tech PR and marketing since 1981, immediately after the launch of the IBM PC. And he had many positions, and the number of his positions as uh, chief executive officer, director, chairman, senior vice president, senior uh, CEO again, vice president, director, and so on, is this big. But actually, I forgot my glasses, so I cannot read it. On the other hand, he's really with the vast and specific educational background. Uh, he completed scientific high school degree in majoring in science, and then he completed his first dottore degree, in which is some sort of PhD, uh, in economy and human geography, and essentially it was topic was dedicated to marketing in his PhD thesis. After that, he completed three master theses in journalism, in business administration, and in marketing, and then another PhD in marketing. So, um, significant background, significant experience, and uh, diverse topics of his interest, and actually, that's something that attracted our attention, and this is the third time that Italo is speaking to us. He is our regular, every year, keynote speaker. First speech was about LibreOffice and 10 years of that software, which is the main Office Suite uh, free software available today. I use free software since I'm Stallmanist, I'm hardline free software approach. And uh, next uh, is uh, next presentation was about highly political issue, and that political issue was digital sovereignty. And now we have a lecture about free software, and I have to say open source software uh, sustainability. So I would like to ask Italo Vignoli to make his presentation. So you're welcome here, and please take your place. Okay, morning everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here in, uh, in Belgrade. Actually, it's the second time of my life I am in Belgrade. Uh, the first time was exactly 40 years ago. I was uh, slightly younger than today, and uh, we, we were through Yugoslavia at the time uh, to go to Greece uh, on vacation with my wife which is there. So, uh, and my talk today is about uh, sustainability of open source software. Why this topic? So open source software is an industry, but still uh, we as open source advocates have some issues in uh, considering as an industry. We uh, consider us as more as individuals or small groups of communities, we don't have uh, yet the capability of uh, making a real system. Uh, and, uh, but we are in a real economy. And I will uh, try to give you some numbers to understand uh, that open source uh, is really uh, reaching far more than uh, is current value. Okay, so this, this is a slide from uh, a venture capitalist company. And uh, uh, the fact that venture capitalists that are typically, have been typically backing uh, the, the proprietary software industry and proprietary hardware industry for years is quite significant. Uh, of course, uh, the difference is that as you can see, they they give numbers where numbers when there are not numbers. So there's there's not an open source 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Um, but this is because they are used to, uh, you know, to, to create this kind of um, different eras or different uh, uh, stages of development. Um, and also, what they want to demonstrate is that they can uh, they have a place on so-called open source 3.0 
because uh, this is the stage where open source has reached maturity and uh, it's probably the last 10 years uh, since around 2010 when uh, large companies, extremely large companies, have started either to move to open source or to rely ex to exclusive on open source software. And when I say large companies, uh, I'm talking about Microsoft. Microsoft uh, uh, declares to have uh, the majority of their servers on their cloud are Linux servers. Uh, and uh, if Microsoft that has been uh, um, su supporting uh, a proprietary server operating system uh, for years has moved to Linux. This means uh, that there's no comparison between the two, basically between the two operating system. At least at server uh, stage, I can tell you that I'm, I'm a Linux user and uh, there's no comparison even at desktop stage, but that is a different story. Um, Amazon, as an infrastructure, is the largest cloud provider in the world. As an infrastructure which is 100% open source, all the servers are Linux, all the services on the servers are Linux based. They use uh, uh, MongoDB, they use Elastic Software, they use Redis uh, to support their uh, balancing. Uh, so it's uh, the reality is that when uh, you place an order on Amazon, uh, which is uh, extremely user-friendly today, you are accessing a Linux background uh, and you don't realize just because uh, they have been uh, able to create a very easy to use uh, interface, but the services behind that are all Linux based. And I can make other examples uh, Oracle databases are running on Linux servers, typically since forever. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, this has raised the interest of uh, venture capitalists that are looking at fast-growing markets to make money. And making money in, in ethical ways is not, is not a problem. Uh, the, the problem is that the venture capitalists do not understand the reality of open source. So what they've done, in some cases, uh, they wanted to have return on investment which was uh, too fast for open source. And uh, for some of the names that I've mentioned before, so MongoDB, Redis, uh, Redis Labs, Elastic, the venture capitalists have uh, basically forced the project to switch to a non-open source license to justify the price tag on the software. So open source software is not always free and in my opinion it should be free only in a limited amount of cases, individual users, but when you, uh, when you think about uh, a large uh, infrastructure there's, there is added value on top of it. You don't pay the license, but you have to pay the added value. You have to pay what is built on top of the of free software. So that is just to comment about the economy, but I will come back on, on the topic afterwards. Typically, the stages of open source project are three. Uh, there is a technical stage when the software starts to be developed. That is developer only, or mostly developers. Then you have uh, the, 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 let's call it the open source stage when uh, the developers release the software and start to aggregate a community around it. And the community starts to be not only developers, but also other people, for instance. Uh, of course, I will make many examples related to LibreOffice because that is the project where I'm active, mostly active, and the project I know better than others. But for instance, LibreOffice is localized in 120 different languages. To, to localize a software in 120 different languages, you, don't, you, you need people that is able to translate the software, to translate the, the manuals, to translate the guides. And these are usually not developers, they are other people. 
people that study linguistics or they are simply uh, open source advocates that like to, to translate the software. You have to write the manuals and you, you need technical writers. You, you have to do marketing and you need people like me that is able to do marketing, but not just this, you have to grow the community. You have to, uh, and you start to be, you realize that although the project was born as a totally uh, open source software, you, and, and it's not a company, but it starts to be extremely similar to a company. You need the uh, processes, you need the, and uh, that is uh, the stage where then uh, companies come to the open source software and you start to have an ecosystem. The ecosystem is uh, what is around the, the core, which is the main project, and uh, these are companies that are adding value. You have people that do trainings. To use a software, you need to learn how to use the software. So you need trainers. I am a LibreOffice trainer, so I can do trainings in Italian, in English, I did in, them in, Fran in uh, French. Um, and you need people that is able to adapt the software to different realities. So you need people that is uh, consultants, that uh, help you to, uh, to, to make the software running inside a company, which is not just uh, replacing a software, is uh, replacing the software, uh, explaining to people why the replacement makes sense, uh, training the people, and uh, in many cases changing the insides of the company, the, 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 um, the workflow inside the company, to, to, to adapt the workflow to a different software. So, um, and now we are well behind or over the third stage. Um, large projects have an ecosystem around them. Uh, I can mention Drupal. Drupal has companies that are uh, like Acuya, but not only Acuya, uh, that is founded by Dries Buitert, uh, the same founder of the Drupal project, but you have WordPress with Automatic, and you have other companies as well uh, that are behind uh, open source project. So we are well inside the third stage. We are a mature industry, although we, don't, we, we still have difficulties in thinking that we are an industry. And if we look at the growth of the code, uh, it's incredible. Today, the majority of the code, uh, the estimate is over 90% is based on open source software. You have a stack of proprietary, in, uh, when you have a proprietary application, apart some specific ones, you usually have a stack of proprietary software on top of a huge stack of open source software. The operating system of the Macintosh, for instance, has a huge stack of open source software and a small stack of proprietary software, which is the user interface. So when you're running uh, Mac OS, uh, you are really running a free BSD machine uh, with a proprietary interface. This doesn't happen with Windows. Windows has no real uh, open source kernel. Uh, it's impossible to look into Windows, so uh, expressing judgment on how Windows is done is just pure speculation. Windows is probably the last example of totally proprietary software. And I would add a personal comment, and this is why it works. It doesn't work uh, at the same way or uh, well enough uh, to, to be used. Unfortunately, the majority of people is using Windows, but then the majority of people gives money to the antivirus industry, to the, there is a huge amount of people that make their living out of the fact that Windows is a terribly bad operating system. And uh, this, uh, the, these two slides uh, are from uh, Red Hat uh, uh, 2022, so they're very recent. All the one, all the, apart from a few ones that are from 2019, all the other slides are from the last two, 
two years. So this uh, is March 2022 and uh, is uh, made on a large sample of uh, uh, software users, especially in the enterprise. And the majority says that open source is strategically important. But not only this, 77%, which is quite a large percentage, thinks that enterprise open source is growing. So we, what we have to realize as open source advocates is that our industry is growing. And uh, it's really time uh, to start thinking that we are an industry and uh, that we have uh, to become a system behind open source software because that's the only way where there will be enough money coming into the open source software to have the next generation. It's not because you write uh, open source 3.0 that you will have the next generation. You will have, we will have the next generation because there will be enough money to invest in further development, in uh, bringing the software, for instance, in countries where it's, uh, English is a, uh, is a barrier. Um, think about uh, uh, all the Asian continent, South America. They need software in their native language. Their knowledge of English is limited. And uh, it would be impossible for me to make a, such a talk in, in, a, in a foreign language because we are in Serbia, you, you speak Serbian and speaking English, and I hope you, everyone understands properly what I'm saying. In South America, I have to speak Spanish. Uh, my poor Spanish, but they prefer my poor Spanish to English because they don't understand English. And in Asia, I often need a, an interpreter. And this shouldn't happen. We should have people that is able to go to these countries and speak uh, their language. And uh, to do this, you need money. I mean, people at the end of the month, they get the bills for their house and uh, they have to pay their food uh, and they have to enjoy their vacations uh, even if they work in open source. So we need more money and it's not because I'm greedy, um, it's because I think that's the only way to develop the industry. Uh, and of course uh, uh, open source software will uh, come uh, to a detriment of proprietary software. There's n I mean we will replace proprietary software. We have already replaced proprietary software on server and uh, we, are, we are replacing more slowly proprietary software on the desktop. By the way, with the pandemics, uh, many people were forced to go home and work from home uh, basically in a matter of less than a week. And uh, that was a turning point for free software because many people started to download uh, and use uh, free software products because they, they didn't have any choice. So if you have to work on, on your computer at home, you cannot, for instance, install the same Microsoft Office license. You should buy another license. And many people downloaded LibreOffice, downloaded Thunderbird to use, uh, uh, to replace uh, Outlook. And, uh, and that was positive because it exposed open source software to a larger number of people. Many of them, they are now back to, to, to Windows, uh, but because companies in many cases force them to use Windows, but at least they have been exposed to open source software. And of course the change is going to, uh, to, 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 be, to, to make an impact. The fact that Microsoft has decided and announced to move uh, that they love Linux it's not because they really love Linux. It's because they want a future in software and they know that the future of software is in open source. So they have started to move, uh, to, to, to show that they are open to move uh, their, open, their software stack to open source because that is going to be open stack, the, 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 the software of the future. And uh, open source is extremely important in the enterprise. If you are a consultant in en at enterprise level, you know that most servers will be Linux-based and most services will be Linux-based. When uh, we did the migration of the uh, Italian uh, 
Ministry of Defense. They, have, uh, they are using LibreOffice now on 100,000 desktops. And uh, we, we, I was in several meetings uh, because, of course, uh, the, the move was scrutinized at every level. And uh, I remember in a meeting where we, the people was then, but what will happen at server level because we, we cannot have a product on the desktop that's not compatible with the server. And the answer from the, their IT manager that was also a general, uh, he said, uh, ah, that's not a problem, our servers are 100% Linux. And the politicians that were in the same room, they thought that the, so their servers were 100% Windows. And they said, why they are 100% Linux? Because this is the NATO standard. We cannot use Windows by NATO standards. And by the way, even if the, stand, the NATO standard was Windows, we would use Linux because it's more secure. So when we send uh, uh, orders, we want them to get through independently from the condition of the network. And uh, uh, so that is the, uh, the, the reality. Large enterprises, and I can tell you that an army is a rather large enterprise, uh, are using uh, Linux on their servers. And the reason why they are using Linux are many, uh, and of course I will leave you the, the, the slides so you, you, you will be able to read them uh, in detail, uh, but of course uh, the advantages are in multiple places. You can you can look into the code if you are you can uh, basically hire developers to make the code better for your specific needs this you cannot do with any proprietary software and uh, about the, the quality of software uh, because people say but if uh, the software is developed by many different people in many different parts of the world uh, they are not inside the same room uh, and uh, so how, why, how the software can be better. It, the software is better because these people have developed um, processes of development that ensure the quality of the software. And uh, I can tell you that the, the, the level of quality that is put into LibreOffice um, at every major release is incredible. So we test the product for months. And we have thousands of users that help us in, uh, in, uh, in uh, taking uh, out uh, the bugs and the regressions. And of course, the software, when it comes out, uh, will uh, still have bugs and regressions because that is the reality of software. There's no software without bugs and regressions, including Windows, including Microsoft Office, you are, kind, you are invitely invited to go to Microsoft uh, website. There is a list of 15,000 15000 known errors of Microsoft Office. Errors that cannot be solved. There are 15,000 workarounds. Uh, and when I, because I, I'm a marketer, so I'm sometimes, I'm, let's say, I'm not the nicest person in the world. When, when I have users that reply, say, but Microsoft has no bugs, I said, no, they have more than 15,000. These 15,000 are declared, then, all, then, then there are others that are not declared. Uh, of course, it's easy to say that your software is perfect. You, you hide the issues to other people. We don't hide the issues. Our source code is publicly available. It's not a problem. And uh, this is a question about sustainability. This is from a 2019 uh, uh, survey. Uh, and uh, you see that there's no a complete agreement on this. 63 says yes, but there is a 30% that says, I'm not sure that is sustainable. And uh, actually, I can tell you that the 30% is, uh, is more right than the 60%. Not that open source is not sustainable, but the fact that enterprises have not yet started to understand 
that they have to, to support open source on a continuous basis. On the other hand, open source projects have not access enterprise in the right way. Because changing the license is not the right way of interacting with, a, with an enterprise. The right way is, uh, guys, we need to sit around the table because the, the, the software that you have today, if you don't support it, we cannot guarantee that you will have the same software tomorrow. Because uh, if you don't support the development at certain stage by hiring developers, by paying uh, uh, new features, by doing whatever, translations, there are many, many ways you can, uh, you can contribute. If you don't contribute, there's no warranty that the open source uh, project will stay there forever. Again, open source developers and other people, at the end of the month, they have to pay their uh, rent of the apartment, they have to pay for their bills, they have to eat, drink, like any other individual. So, of course, uh, why uh, organizations should contribute to open source software? Because uh, it's, it's a part of the game. We don't ask you a, a license cost, but you have to understand that you have to pay for some of the added value. And how they can uh, contribute? I mean, the way that they can contribute are really multiple. You can pay developers, uh, you, you can uh, work with contractors or, uh, that support open source software. Uh, we, we don't ask for a direct payment. For instance, uh, we have uh, the uh, Hungarian government is using LibreOffice. They pay a dozen developers to uh, work on uh, the uh, interoperability of formats. So most of the improvements that LibreOffice has got in terms of interoperability with the uh, Microsoft Office non-standard format is thanks to the, uh, to the Hungarian government. They don't give money directly to the project, but they help the project to grow. And this is uh, one of the ways that the project can, uh, that you can contribute to, the, to, to, to a project. It's not just by putting money into the project, it's by helping the ecosystem to grow and to sustain and support the software. And uh, this again, uh, you see, is the, the, the it's again uh, a venture capitalist uh, uh, slide. Uh, you see, they, they try to, 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 to put everything into boxes. And uh, it's not really possible, but look at this box. This is uh, the, the real open source uh, where you have uh, value, added value that is paid. Red Hat. Red Hat is uh, now a three billion uh, uh, dollar software company. They basically, um, I think that 80% of that is not based on licenses. It's based on uh, added value. It's based on consultancy, it's based on uh, training, it's based on this kind of, uh, and SUSE is the same, it's a smaller, it's half that. Red Hat uh, was purchased by IBM for $35 billion. So, so a $3 billion company is purchased for 10 times the value because the fact is that they have the right business model. It's not easy. It took them years to, to get to that point. And of course, uh, then you have other ones, and then you, you go to the, they call it multi-licensing. <laughs> multi-licensing means uh, you have uh, what doesn't work uh, as an open source license, what works, you have to give me money. Because it, this is what the, the, the venture capitalists understand. They understand that they want money for licenses. They think that that is the only 
working uh, uh, way of having software, which is not true. Uh, so the, the, the issue is not new, uh, so I'm not telling you anything really uh, revolutionary, but let's say that in, uh, there have been uh, three days, 2014, uh, many people probably remember the heart bleed uh, uh, bug. That was the first point of uh, people uh, uh, realizing uh, that a strategic uh, open source project could not rely just on the goodwill of two, three developers. So they started to pay these developers to maintain the, 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 the software. And uh, in 2016, a researcher, Nadia Ekbal, uh, wrote a, this paper, which ha is actually a book because it's over 100 pages, Roads and Bridges, the Unseen Labor Behind Our Digital Infrastructure. You can download it for free. It's uh, been sponsored by the Ford Foundation. It's very interesting. It's a systematization of all the process. And in 2019, Dries Buitert, Dries is the founder of Drupal at Akuya, published a, a, an extremely interesting blog post, is Balancing Makers and Takers to Scale and Sustain Open Source. This is probably the best analysis of the situation that you can find. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about Dries, uh, because I think uh, he, as I try to summarize his uh, input, but my suggestion is to read the entire blog post, uh, which is several pages, and uh, because he really analyzes the entire uh, um, situation and makes uh, some interesting uh, uh, proposals. So, um, this start from analyzing the, the, the the open source community. You remember the, the, the second slide, I, it was the three stages. Basically, this, uh, the example that he makes are roads. So the roads are, uh, crea are created by volunteers. Of course, not the road that we see, the road that we see today have changed a lot, but try to imagine uh, going back uh, to when roads were not existing. So volunteers started to create roads between villages uh, to, to move between villages. And uh, then uh, when, when uh, people realized that the roads were interesting enough to, to make business, then they, they started to make business out of the road, and then the road became a common uh, resource, and then the countries took the road uh, and, and now maintain the road. So today, it's Serbia, it's Italy, it's France, it's Spain that are maintaining the roads because the roads are part of our common infrastructure. It's the infrastructure that we don't pay directly, but we pay with taxes because it is maintained to make uh, moving around the country possible. And the software in this sense is similar. You start with, with volunteers, then uh, you, you start with someone, it's not, in, in open source you don't have the privatization stage, but you have the stage where the, the volunteers are put to, uh, start to come together in, into a, a project. And then uh, you, you get to the point where the, the, it is a system. And uh, we, we, let's say that we, we find it difficult as an industry to move from this to this stage. Because that is the stage where we should start forgetting that we support a single project and sit around, it sit around the table and uh, think as a member of the large open source community, not as a member of um, Debian, Ubuntu or uh, another distribution. And uh, I've heard people from distributions uh, fighting each other because no, we do security better than you. Come on, stop doing, stop doing this useless discussion, sit around the table and make security better for everyone 
Someone will have a better security, but someone will have better user interface, and uh, someone will have, uh, I don't know, better uh, package integration. So let's put it together, not work in, on, as separate entities. Uh, can you imagine if uh, all the Linux distribution together could find, uh, could put together a single distribution that is easy to use, solid, robust, secure, that can really make competition, can be, really be a competitor to Windows? Because the, the difference is that if you want to, if you start using Linux, people will tell you, no, you should use Linux Mint because it's better than Ubuntu, because it's, uh, oh no, you should use Debian. Debian is absolutely the best. But why you should have uh, a de debt-based uh, distribution? You should go to RPM. So you should start and uh, do Arc Linux or, this is just useless. It's interesting at developer's level, it's useless at system level. At system level, we should work together. Then you can say Debian has contributed security to the, to the large and uh, maybe Ubuntu has contributed the uh, user interface and I don't know. But being separate doesn't help the, the industry. And of course the same applies when you go a, le a further level. So, and uh, Dri says, I, I, I understand that the idea of making this a system, in, um, that not everyone does, does like the idea, but I think uh, personally that is absolutely right. So either we, we transform our, uh, let's say, individualities into a system, or uh, we, we will always uh, discuss about the potential of open source without getting to the real, uh, to the real solution. Uh, and sustainability, of course, is, uh, is immediately related to this, because if, you, uh, if your system uh, works, uh, then it becomes almost automatically sustainable. It will be easier for uh, people that want to give money to open source to understand when they, to whom they, they should give money if uh, the, the, the picture of open source w would be uh, simpler than it is today. And of course, uh, he says, Dri says, it's not necessary that everyone changes his business model, but it's important that the largest project do this because otherwise, we again, we, 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 we go in circles around ourselves. And then he introduces the concept of makers and takers. So makers are people that are developing open source, but not just development, that are developing, translating, uh, writing manuals, doing QA, uh, supporting infrastructure. So all the people that are working behind open source are makers. And then the people that are just taking the the software and not contributing back are takers. And the takers are disrupting open source exactly because they don't contribute back. Because, uh, uh, and uh, I, I'll, um, I'll show the, uh, a slide after a, a, a visual slide because visual images are usually better than words to describe uh, a, a concept. But the reality is that the makers are fighting, uh, are in the same market as the takers, and uh, there's no way that a maker can win if there is a taker in the market. And let's look at this. Let's say that a maker makes one million dollars out of open source and reinvest 500,000 in open source and 500,000 on, uh, let's say, the, the intellectual property that in this case is uh, sharing the money around the people that have contributed so paying salaries and so on the taker will invest back 50000 and keep the rest 950 and how and and this will be more money for the shareholders will be more money for uh, the venture capitalist 
and so on. And of course, you, you, it's easy to understand by looking at the two images why this uh, will win over this. Because uh, in this money, there will be money for lobby. And lobby will kill this. This is the unfortunate uh, situation. Um, it's um, just to make a, a very uh, small example. You have probably heard about the uh, move to uh, Linux of, the, of Munich, the city in Bayern. So the city moved to Linux. It was working. The, it worked for 14 years. Uh, also, the airport was managed by Linux, and uh, they didn't have any accident, any, any, uh, any, any flight um, delayed or lost uh, for 14 years. But then what happened? It happened that a company paid uh, the um, political campaign to the two candidates for the mayor role, and one of them, of course, won. And ironically, because of the Grosse Coalition, the second one became, became the deputy mayor. So they paid, basically paid the political campaign to the mayor and to the deputy mayor. Guess what? They're, they use Windows now. So you can probably understand the name of the company that, by the way, is based on one Microsoft Plaza in Redmond. But I won't tell you the name of the company. Uh, when we started LibreOffice, we, we wanted to relaunch the innovation because, uh, again, a company, proprietary software, purchased Sun and they didn't have a clue about open source. Apart from MySQL, they wanted to control MySQL to avoid that MySQL was growing enough uh, to, to become a threat for Oracle databases. So we, we basically, we forked the software to make the software innovative again. Because of course, if, you, if the company that is behind the project doesn't want to develop the project, the project is uh, slowing, fading away. And uh, we are in a market uh, which has been discussed since almost forever. I mean, I've been in, uh, uh, in this market since 2002, so it's around 20 years as an open source advocate. And uh, so I entered the, the, the open office uh, uh, ecosystem in 2002 because I didn't want to use Outlook, base, basically. Uh, so I have a funny religion that doesn't allow me to eat banana and use Outlook. Uh, out of that, I don't have a, a real religion. Uh, so I, I started, I installed uh, OpenOffice and uh, I realized that the software was promising. So after one year, I sent an email to the, to the community manager and said, uh, you have a fantastic product, but your marketing is really zero. And the answer was, who are you to say that marketing is really zero? I said, it's someone that is paying his bills with marketing for the last 20 years. So maybe I can tell you a little bit. Uh, I started to do, but they didn't trust me. So I started to do marketing in it, of open office just in Italy at the time. And in six months, the number of downloads went through from two to eight millions. So they, they called me again and said, oh, it happens that your marketing activity is effective. And I said, I told you before, so I, they, they, I was, uh, let's say, co-opted into global marketing of open office, community side, and I started to contribute to the project. And since then, there has always been the discussion about office suites. Are they going to stay or are they going away? Uh, if you think uh, about the software, in fact, uh, uh, office suites are not uh, a, a very interesting piece of software. You can write the text, uh, do some mathematics with a, with a, with a, with a spreadsheet, uh, do the presentation. It's nothing 
incredibly exciting. So the people said that there will be something that will replace office suites. The fact is that it's 20 years that they say that there will be something that replaces office suite, but nothing was uh, really coming. And even when they move completely to the cloud or try to move completely to the cloud, yes, the market stopped a little bit, but now is growing back again and uh, is growing over the previous, uh, the previous size. Uh, two signs that the market is interesting. Uh, uh, the, this was a project uh, that died in 2019 because it was the company that ran this uh, was acquired by a proprietary software company. So they, it was called Future of Open Source. And in 2017, uh, LibreOffice was featured amongst the seven most important software, and that was completely unexpected. And if you look at the other software in the list of the top seven, mm, they're all completely different. Either they are uh, uh, enterprise software or uh, uh, Linux distribution. So uh, that was a surprise, but two years after, uh, Ubuntu started a discussion with the users because they said, uh, oh, we are sure that you don't want uh, LibreOffice anymore as a default uh, office suite. Uh, you, you probably want Google Docs. And this was the, the answer of the user. So it's not even uh, worth commenting. Uh, if you look at the green is LibreOffice and the other colors are all the rest. So it was 78% said, no, we want LibreOffice. And uh, it was uh, basically amazing because they, the, the Ubuntu people were absolutely sure before starting. They sent us a message, said, oh, we, are, we are sorry, but we will, uh, after the, the survey, we will for sure uh, not use LibreOffice anymore. And then uh, they, they, they called and said, sorry, we were a little bit wrong. Uh, it looks like our user want LibreOffice, so we will continue to invest in LibreOffice. And uh, so which are the, the, the current users of LibreOffice? Of course, it's the LibreOffice community that supports with donations. And, uh, and then uh, there, there, there are the, the, the LibreOffice Enterprise version, which is not released by the project because we cannot release software we are a not-for-profit, so we cannot ask for money for the, for the software. We are starting to ask for money for the software from app stores because that is a different story, is related to the rules of the app stores. But on, on a general uh, rule, uh, the software that is downloaded from our the LibreOffice website is free. So, uh, but there are companies that are releasing an enterprise version of LibreOffice, which means an enterprise version. There is a service license agreement, service level agreement. They tell you that if you find a bug, uh, you, you pay some money, but they will solve the bug within two, three, four, five days. We cannot, as a project, as an open source project, we cannot give you a, a service level agreement. You file the bug, uh, and the bug will be solved uh, in due time when uh, developers will have time. If, if the bug is uh, really strategic for you, you have to pay a developer that solved that bug. That is part of the game. In this way, you support open source. Uh, the problem is that uh, we have, uh, instead of having uh, just a few free riders and a majority of enterprise that support us, we have the opposite. We have uh, probably between 5 and 7% of enterprise using LibreOffice paying for the software. And we have more than 90% of them not, pay, not giving anything back. And we, have to, we are working. Uh, we, we, we were at 4, now we are at 7. So it's uh, just uh, something uh, we, we, we have invested the last two years to, to change the situation. Uh, because that is... Uh, the market for office suite. We are uh, 2022, it's uh, 27 billion dollars, not million, billion dollars. And it's growing at a rate of 5% per year. The analysts uh, give us uh, 
give open source software around 10% of that market, which means uh, that uh, this is not the value of the market in terms of uh, license sold. It's the value of the market in terms of user value. So it's not based on the money that companies declare, but it's based on the number of users and the work that the users are doing. So we have 10% of that market. 10% of that market means uh, that our value, the value of our share, would be $2.7 billion. We are not even today at 1% of that value in terms of business generated around the project. So I think that 1% is definitely the wrong, the wrong percentage we are aiming at least at 10%. Then, of course, it would be nice to be at 50% because you can imagine what we could do with, if we could spend $1 billion. Just imagine what we could do in continents like Africa in terms of education of people. In uh, Asia develop software for uh, specific languages that are at risk of disappearing and give them the software in their language. We could provide the software for free to all the schools to a certain level. We could make arrangements with universities for giving them special prices or special version of LibreOffice for their research needs. And that's just because uh, the project is supported in a different way by enterprises that are already using the software, but are not giving back any money. So just imagine, because we don't want to become rich. I mean, we want to have a normal life. So get to the end of the month uh, without having issues. That's the, the objective of, usually, of open source advocates, usually. So we would reinvest the majority of the money in growing uh, the ecosystem around us. And the ecosystem around us is done by students, is by um, poor countries that cannot... Uh, just imagine what happens in Africa. They, they get refurbished computers from uh, uh, Europe and from the, uh, from the States. There are not for, profit, not for profits that get those computers. And uh, they distribute that for free in the schools and they use, usually use Linux as operating system because it has no price tag on it. Just imagine how many schools we, more we could reach with such a project and what this would mean in terms of um, economy for a continent like Africa. Of course, uh, this because it would make a huge difference, but we could make a, a big difference in, even in Europe, where I say the majority of people has not the same uh, issues of Africa in terms of uh, uh, survival uh, problems. Uh, so that's uh, uh, something that we could really change uh, and uh, improve a lot the environment around us. And this is uh, the, 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 the percentage I was telling you. So you see open source, uh, uh, it's 16%. Uh, in, th in that area, LibreOffice is the majority, but we try to, to stay a little bit lower. So it, this is why I tell you 10%. And uh, by the way, today, uh, at least 50% of Office uh, Suite users are using more than one Office Suite, not just uh, they're using maybe one uh, online, one cloud, and one on the desktop. And uh, these are the size of companies, and uh, these are the attributes associated to Office Productivity Suite. Just a comment on uh, the last one. Quality of customer support. So open source, the, the blue dot is open source. We, we do support with volunteers, so I can understand that quality of support, uh, it's maybe misunderstood, 
because of course the volunteer is not as answering to phones. But the fact that the yellow is Microsoft Office 365, it's a nonsense. Have you ever tried to call uh, Microsoft for support of a product and say it doesn't work? So the best answer you, you get is, it's your fault, it's not our fault, if you get the answer. But the perception of people is that they provide a fantastic uh, support, which is completely wrong. And we should use some of the money to change this perception. And uh, so these are the attributes when considering office productivity, but I'll go uh, to the conclusion. So our model was clear since we started. We wanted to be an independent project with a large ecosystem. We, we want to grow the ecosystem. We have a few companies in the ecosystem. We want to probably double the number of these companies. Of course, if we want to double the number of these companies without damaging the current companies, we have to double the number of the value of the ecosystem. Because it's not by attracting a company that takes the money out of another company that we will make a good, a good job. We need to grow, let's say, the cloud, uh, the economic cloud around open source software. And uh, uh, LibreOffice has a huge reach. If you think LibreOffice is really at the, in the middle of open source because you, you, you use LibreOffice to write reports, to make presentation, to do calculations, to, to design drawings. Uh, it basically can interface with any other open source software. So we are in the position, if we do it right, we are in the right position to, in, to grow. Uh, these are our stakeholders. The problem, of course, is that even if you are a user, apart from people that is working in the, in, uh, in the project, your relationship with, with, the, with the office suite is very loose. It's a commodity. It's a similar relation that we have uh, with our mobile phones today. If I lose, m I mean, if I lose mine, I can get another one. The, the feature will be more or less the same apart from if you have a premium, premium one, uh, and I'm not even convinced that a premium, premium one is worth the price. Uh, but basically, the majority of products provide enough features to users to be usable. So uh, our, our objective, and this is our community, so we have volunteers, we have the ecosystem, but there are many person working in ecosystem companies or being paid for part of their time that then work as uh, volunteers in the evening. We have guys that are developers during the day and translators during, uh, the, during the evening because they translate in their language although they are paid to be developers during the day and they are not paid to, to translate during, the, uh, during their free time. Uh, and this is uh, a more or less a breakdown of the development in the last two years. So 68% of LibreOffice code was developed by companies in the enterprise in the ecosystem, uh, around 28% by volunteers and 4% by TDF employees. We have a small team of around 12 people uh, that, and some of them are developers. So let's say that these people are not considered because they're part of the, of the process. The Document Foundation doesn't pay developers directly because the model says that developers should be paid by ecosystem companies. We are discussing today to hire a couple of developers for specific tasks, um, accessibility, which doesn't seem to be um, popular in enterprises but we need to have the software that can be accessible by blind people, deaf people, and people with disabilities. Uh, and these uh, are contribution at community level. So you see that there is a, a, a core of 46 people that are producing 78% of, of the uh, commits. Um, I'm 
out of this, uh, I work basically almost full time on LibreOffice, but I'm, as I'm not committing anything, I'm, I'm not committing marketing materials, so I'm not one of the people that is counted, while people that do translation are counted because they commit the, the translation. So of course this uh, is what is countable in terms of uh, numbers. Uh, who pays for the development already told you the majority of the development by volunteers uh, is localization and user interface because these are the parts that are more accessible to people that is not working full time on code because otherwise LibreOffice is 7 million lines of code uh, you, you need a little bit of experience to, to work on it. So we want to be the best office suite ever. I think we, we have reached that goal. But then uh, now our uh, challenge is to start becoming a real uh, uh, industry. And uh, as we know that we cannot become an industry by ourselves, uh, we want to work with other projects to make the open source a real industry. Because that is the only way uh, that we have uh, to be uh, to 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 get to the result that we want to have. Um, we have developed the concept of LibreOffice technology. Um, it's this makes it simple to understand. So these are the other office suites. Uh, so if you use Microsoft Office uh, on the desktop and on mobile, you will have two, two different software. One is the, the software for the desktop, and the other one is the software for mobile. They are being rewritten, not the same engine. If you use LibreOffice, you use the same engine on every platform. This means that you produce exactly the same document, and I challenge you, uh, Try to use, uh, uh, you have a, a version of LibreOffice for Android, it's called CollaboraOffice. Collabora is one of the ecosystem companies. If you create a document with CollaboraOffice and you open it with LibreOffice, you will have exactly the same document. No issue of interoperability, absolutely nothing. The only thing that changes is the user interface, of course. We, you cannot have the, the same user interface on the desktop and on mobile for uh, sp space reason, uh, uh, reasons and on the cloud for, uh, uh, because that is HTML, so it, it has to be a little bit different. But we have changed the user interface. We didn't change anything of the rest. And uh, so the next 10 years, we will strongly use uh, the LibreOffice technology. We have a, also a, a logo for that. Uh, we don't want to, many people think that the Document Foundation is a software vendor, we are not. So we, we want to reduce the, the, this, uh, this perception and uh, we want to communicate better. And uh, the objective is to get to this. So individuals that us today, they support us with, with donations. A few free riders, we, we know that this, they are part of the game. You will never contribute to open source software from day one. You will start moving to open source software, and once you have realized how strategic it is, you can start contributing. That is fair. So you will start using the software for free, for one, a couple of years, then you realize that the software is part of your strategic infrastructure, and you should start to contribute. And we, the objective is to have many people that in many different ways contribute to the, to the project. And do a lot of education. Uh, for instance, uh, with the Italian Ministry of Defense, I, for six months, and my wife can confirm, I had a General Sileo that was the IT manager of the Italian, uh, the Italian um, army, calling me at eight o'clock in the evening and saying, we have found a bug. Oh, happy, there are two thousands. Um, and um, you have to solve the bug. Impossible. Why? Because uh, 
if we solve the bug for free, in a few years you will not have LibreOffice for your desktops. Why? Because that developer, at the end of the month, will get a bill that is not able to pay. So he will have to leave the project and go to another project. So after six months, and uh, being really absolutely firm in answering, they said, okay, so according to you, you we should buy a little bit of several copies of, um, several licenses of the enterprise version. I said, you got it. So now they pay 40,000 licenses and they use 60,000 for free. It's okay. I mean, if all the enterprise users pay 40% and use 60% for free, we would be absolutely delighted. What they've done, they said, these 40,000 are the strategic ones. These are the desktops that are used daily. We cannot have bugs. We cannot have issues on these. 60,000 are the desktop that are using once a week to write a letter, to write the report to the bosses. If the report comes out not perfect, it's not a problem. It's not strategic. We can use the free version. If there is a bug, we will find a workaround. And it's working. It's now since 2018, so it's seven, they're going into the seven year. They're already confirmed the licenses for 2023. So it's working. They're happy. We are happy. And uh, I hope it was clear. There is quite a lot of, let's say, background uh, on this. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer the question. If you don't have the questions, I think I was more or less in the time. Okay, Tala, thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to ask for questions now. And since we have only one movable mic, uh, if you have questions, it would be really kind if you could step down. Yeah? Okay, that's okay. Okay, so questions? But I, I can, I can, uh, you can use that one and maybe we can pass around this one. I, I can, yeah. yeah. Okay, and we can pass around this one. So, questions please? Come on, you, you must have a question to... Yeah. Uh, I think I can yell uh, enough so I don't have to take... No, it's not, otherwise it's not going to be registered. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for this descriptively useful and insightful uh, presentation and lecture in its own right. Um, and I think that the organizing committee also would like to share that impression with me. Uh, nevertheless, I do have two questions or comments for that matter. So the first one uh, is about commercialization. So starting from one of your initial slides on which that particular lexical item was put, so commercialization, and commercial as an adjective afterwards. Um, how can we uh, actually connect uh, LibreOffice, so the open office, uh, and uh, that commercial side? So you, you mentioned the turning point, so the paramount event back in 2018 as uh, some sort of commercialized uh, reference point. Um, I myself am not, uh, so I am neither a marketing expert nor uh, an expert in the domain of economics, but since you also mentioned the word sustainability, how can we have sustainability without commercialization? Is it possible? So that I mean, was the first question. The second one, if I may uh, also, what would be your comment upon uh, the British government's decision to renew their uh, Windows XP license and everything that goes with that and paying some extra charges for some superb security patches. So that would be the second. So the, the first answer. Um, I think uh, uh, when we uh, 
talk about, um, let's make an example that is not related to LibreOffice, uh, but related to Drupal or WordPress, if you prefer. Um, both Drupal and WordPress uh, are free uh, projects, and they all, they have uh, a number of uh, commercial companies supporting the project and selling services. So the, the, the why I, I mentioned the, the, the concept of becoming a system exactly because we need to stop thinking that the open source project can do everything by itself. We develop the software, we make sure that the software is open, is uh, maintains the open source uh, characteristic, but why then uh, we don't have companies like um, Acuia or Automatic that have experience on, uh, that get their experience on the software because they develop the, 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 the let's say, the, the open source part and because they are knowledgeable about the open source part, they can sell value-added services to people that need value-added services. Um, to make a specific example, uh, all EU uh, websites are based on Drupal. They are all made by a commercial company. So the EU pays for the websites, although they are based on Drupal, but they don't pay for the license of Drupal. They pay for the added value of having, uh, the, for instance, the each side in 27 languages, which is not trivial. So making us uh, uh, the same, the same uh, website in 27 languages is something that only a commercial company can maintain. If we think that we can do that as volunteers, it's just, I mean, I don't think we are doing a good service to ourselves or to the potential customers. This is the same uh, as the LibreOffice version for uh, the Ministry of um, um, Defense in Italy, but not only for that, we have the, the French government is using uh, LibreOffice on 500,000 desktop. Uh, they, they have uh, commercial companies providing services, value added, providing service level agreements that you cannot basically provide uh, if you have volunteers. You cannot ask a volunteer to work overnight. You can ask a paid developer to work overnight to solve a bug that is blocking a feature, let's say, for the uh, Ministry of uh, Economy in, in France. So that is the point where we have to be able to grow together the open source part and the commercial part related to open source that is commercializing value added built on top of open source software. Training is another story. Special versions. Uh, we have uh, a few special versions of LibreOffice done for companies that need a specific feature. That specific feature is just for them because it's not a feature that is interesting for the others. That happens quite frequently with the, with the spreadsheet, with Calc. They, in some cases, they, they have macros that are real programs. So in that case, it's better to have a program instead of a macro. So you use the LibreOffice engine uh, to basically create a, let's call a sister uh, product to Calc that is specific for that company that maybe has a completely different interface as just buttons that call up uh, uh, features and uh, allow the people to create their uh, calculations in an automatic way. So this is what I mean by commercialization, is to use the software to create value-added product or value-added services that have to be sold and by having companies then, and these are the companies like Acuya, for instance, is reinvesting by statute, reinvesting 40% of the revenue on the development of Drupal. So they make, uh, let's say that they make 1 million euro, they will, by, by statutes, they have to reinvest 400,000 euro on the development of Drupal 
not specific version of Drupal for customers, but on the Drupal platform. So develop features uh, and develop uh, this kind of uh, additional value for the open source version. Second question, I think uh, that is uh, just a demonstration uh, of, uh, in some cases, how bad are uh, public servants when they manage IT. Because if you get to the point of having to pay Microsoft uh, to continue to use an old version of Windows that was buggy at the time and uh, it's probably like uh, Gruyere today in terms of holes uh, inside uh, the, the, the program. Uh, um, of course, uh, uh, I, I, Microsoft is making their, I mean, they're just making their business. If, they f they, if they find people that is paying them money to maintain a, an unmanageable uh, operating system, uh, uh, it's difficult to, to give a judgment. I think uh, that could be easily solved uh, by replacing that with a, with a Linux version and ev would probably cost less uh, to develop a specific Linux version for the use of the uh, for the um, use of the UK government in France, uh, all the the, the, the custom police uh, uh, is using uh, Linux, uh, and they have their own specific distribution, uh, and uh, the French government pays for their specific distribution, but they. They have a Linux distribution on 270,000 desktops. So they're supporting, of course, uh, in this case, uh, it's a Debian based, uh, and uh, a lot of the money goes to Debian uh, developers that are happy to then develop Debian uh, features uh, after the, the, they have developed the paid version for France. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're a little bit out of time. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so f the, the answer is uh, don't focus on what you do, focus on what together you can do. Just think that one of the big values of open source uh, is that is shared knowledge. Open source grows because we share the knowledge. We publish th the source code that for developers is sharing knowledge. Not for me, I'm not able to read the, the open source code, but a developer that is able to read, g looking at the other guy source code is sharing knowledge. So share the knowledge, work together. Don't think that your, uh, your bits and bytes are better than the other guy bits and bytes, because th this will never happen. Sorry, you can be extremely professional as a developer, but you will always find someone that is better than you in some places and some areas. Even extremely senior developers will, can learn from others, and in some cases from young developers, just because the young developer had a brilliant idea that the old one didn't have. So don't stay in, in silos or don't, uh, don't stay behind your desk uh, all of the time, uh, work together, um, share your ideas, because that is the only way where you can grow the community. And if someone that is non-technical is coming to the community, don't scare them by saying, oh, you should do the first patch, otherwise you're not a member of the community. 
For him, the first patch could be something that you don't even understand. My first patch to open office was to create a press release. It's not a patch. But if in six months, because of that press release and others, the downloads went from two to eight million, that was a good result. So don't refuse contribution from non-technical people because they can be as valuable as you are if you are a developer and work together. The good approach would be, sorry, can you explain better what you would do because uh, with my technical background, I don't understand what you're doing. This is perfectly fine. But saying no, you should, because the, the first reaction of people was, you don't have a single patch, so you are useless for the project. That is, sorry, exactly the wrong approach. We should never have this approach. Everyone can be useful for free software. And uh, working together, I mean, uh, um, of course now, LibreOffice is more structured. We have a mentor, two mentors that are helping newcomers. Uh, has not always been like this, uh, um, but think that you need, the, if you grow a, little, a small project, think that the only way you can grow is by g getting more people. Because if you get more people, you get more structured, and uh, you will uh, understand uh, that you are bec that you are creating uh, something that is a real product. A real product is not just code. A real product has documentation, has localization, has a lot of stuff around the code. Okay, I would also have some questions, but sorry, we are out of time, and Nadiz, our boss, is going to shoot me because we are out of time. So maybe we can gather around during this break, and I guess that you, you could ask Italo if you have any further questions. So I would close this session, and let's thank Italo for his nice presentation once again. Okay. Thank you very much.